Hi guys, it's John from Double Sleeved here and we have made it. It is day 10 of 10 in our companion reviews and today we are reviewing Zerda the Dawn Waker. So, Zerda the Dawn Waker, the final companion. I've got a lot of things open on my screens here so I'm going to be flicking backwards and forwards because there's quite a lot I want to talk about with this one. Um, Zerd of the Dawn Waker has kind of slipped under the radar a little bit. Uh, it's an elemental fox, so it's winning straight away by being an elemental. Um, it's a 3-3 three, three for 3. That's one Boros Boros. And its companion rule is each permanent card in your starting deck has an activated ability. I'm not going to lie, even, even with looking through cards all the time, I still have to make sure I know what an activated ability is. I still need to make sure I understand what does and doesn't fall under that. Um, surprisingly, quite a significant number of cards you can choose from. Um, so I didn't necessarily feel limited in terms of overall choice. Although, clearly, there's a lot of cards that are in current meta that do not have an activated ability. So what do you get with her? You get abilities you activate that aren't mana abilities cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. And she also has pay one and tap a target creature can't block this turn. The first style of activated ability that you could play her in, and that is in an adapt deck. So adapt, which was uh, which came out in, I want to say guilds, um, which is all about making Simic creatures bigger. You add 1-1 one, one counters on. Now, there's definitely some counter synergy um, with things like Ozoliths. Um, I'm not sure an Ozolith counts. I don't believe it counts as a permanent card uh, with an activated ability, so you'd be struggling to get her as your companion for that. But either way, her ability does work really well with them. So um, you've got cards like Skitter Eel, um, that's a 3-3 three, three that can grow by 2 plus 1 plus 1s for what would only be one blue. Unfortunately, Simic are not in Zerda's colours, so you'd have to play around with mana a little bit. Growth Chamber Guardian, another one that grows by 2. It's already a 2-2 two, two for 2 that would grow to a 4-4. Four, four. And whenever one or more is placed on it, you can reveal, um, you can search your library for a card named Growth Chamber Guardian, reveal it and put it in your hand. So you can just keep getting more growth chambers, which is good. Incubation Druid, a card that's already well played um, with an Adapt 3 on it. Naturally, that card would sit really nicely in, in the so as, as much as it can add mana. Um, when it then grows, it can then add loads more mana. So definitely a card that would feature in this sort of deck. Um, Soraform Hybrid, which is another 2-2 two, two for 2, which has an Adapt 4, which would cost you only 4 mana to do. Trollbred Guardian, another one, a 5 5 for 5, which adapts by 2, and each creature you control with a plus 1 plus 1. Then has Trample, which is another sweet little benefit. Eremunculus, which is a 2 3, flying for 3, um, can adapt 1, um, which, you know, is okay, but again, you're getting that um, for only 2 mana. And then you've got Combined Guild Mage, um, which adds and, and moves counters around. Um, Shark Joe Crab, <laughs> who doesn't love what has now been um, ratted to be a Shark Octopus Crab, uh, which is a 4 4 for 4 that adapts for one. And then Simic Ascendancy, which just feels like a fun win condition for that deck, um, on top of potentially Smashing Face. The fact that as you add counters, um, you are going to win the game eventually with it. Um, oh, and also, you've got a couple of others. Uh, Zagana Utopian Speaker, um, which is a 4-4 four, for four. four, four. Um, w when it enters, if you've already got 1-1s, one, you draw cards and it adapts for 4. Um, and each creature, again, gets Trample. You've also got Scuttlegator, um, Merfolk Skydiver, um, which is another one that would, uh, would gain you with Adapt. So, lots of... Um, Fun to be had in a Simic deck like that. Rakdos uh, Sacrifice, which has been spoken about three or four times throughout the Companions. Um, I think we start to see Zerda again grow as a, an interesting card. So straight away, 
again, no particular order on these cards. Um, but you've got cards like Sanitarium Skeleton, which for two and a black, you remove it from the graveyard into your hand. That would just be one black. So for one black, you pull Sanitarium Skeleton out of your graveyard, and then for one black, you play it again. That is really powerful in a, in a sacrifice deck. Previously, Sanitarium Skeleton was used anyway, but the fact that it's now only one mana to take it out of the graveyard, that makes this a really intriguing op option um, versus the sort of cat oven combination. Piper of the Swarm is a 1-3 for 2, which has a Ratchet Control Hand Menace, and there's a lot of Menace Synergy going through at the moment, in especially with the Corey coming out. For 1 and a black tap, and create a 1-1 one, one black rat creature token. Um, obviously that's only going to cost you one black to do. Uh, and then for two black black, which would only cost you black black, tap and sacrifice three rats, gain control of target creature. So you're stealing, you're getting a, a, a steal effect, um, a, a, an agent of treachery, which is a seven mana ability, a seven, seven mana creature, um, for two mana and three rats, which could only take you three turns, which so you could, in theory, get that on turn five, you've got, you've stolen the uh, the opponent's creature, which I think is interesting. So Conrad the Grim, another good card in, uh, in Sacrifice, although fairly expensive, for one and a black, each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard, would only cost you black, and when a creature card enters the graveyard from anywhere, it deals one damage to each opponent. Frill Scare Mentor, which works um, pretty well with uh, with the Menace Rats. Um, when Frill Scare Mentor enters the battlefield, put a Menace Counter on target non-human creature. Two and uh, red, which would only cost you a red and tapping, put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control with Menace. So, so those 1-1 one, one rats that you're making suddenly become 2-2 two, two rats for one mana, potentially each turn. Um, that's a pretty scary card. Glinthorn Buccaneer, um, which will be a potential win con in a combo I've got in a minute. Um, it's a hasty, it's already used in sacrifice decks um, or in cycling decks or anything like that. Um, you've got a, when you discard a card, it deals one damage to each opponent. For one and a red, which again would only cost you a red, Discard a card, draw a card, activate this ability only when Buccaneer is attacking. So you attack with five red mana, you discard five cards, you draw five cards. It's card potential card filtering, but more importantly, you're dealing five damage to um, your opponent, which over a couple of turns potentially finishes them off. Or if you've got a significant amount of mana, which we can get, um, then this is a deadly combo. Ogre Siegebreaker. Um, for two black, red, destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn. It's You're going to destroy <laughs> the target creature. Um, and only for black, red. Which again is really, really good. Soul Reaper of Mogus. Uh, for two and a black, sacrifice creature, draw a card. This becomes your oven in theory for things like your skeleton. For one black mana, you sacrifice creature, you draw a card. Uh, really powerful for a 2-3 in black. Dread Malkin, another menace creature for one mana that for two in black sacrifice another creature, so another sacrifice outlet, which would only cost you one black, put two 1-1 one, one counters on Dread Malkin, which can go over and over again. So if you want to keep recurring, for one black mana, you can sacrifice Sanitarium Skeleton, for one mana pull it back out, and for one mana play it. So for three black mana... Dread Malkin becomes a 3-3, and you've still got Skeleton on the board for free, which I think is a very interesting combination. You've also got another Sacrifice Outlet in Spark Reaper, which would normally be 3 in Sacrificing a Creature, but in this it's only 1 in Sacrificing a Creature. Um, you gain 1 life and draw a card. So it's similar to um, the Soul Reaper of Mogus, but you're gaining 1 life as well as you do it. Um, which again all that as a package is incredibly interesting for the sacrifice which currently doesn't run on any, pretty much any of those cards um, because those costs are too high maybe they won't be too high when you've got Zerda on the battlefield 
Um, it does bring me on briefly to talk about cycling. Cycling as um, and is an activated ability and would allow you to play cycling cards and would be a, would enable you to um, cycle for one on I believe every card that has cycling is at least, well I say at least, is three or lower. So in theory, all cards with cycling can be played for one and can be cycled for one. So all the cycling decks that are looking at having really efficient cycling and deals one damage, gains one life, gains creatures, whatever it may be, Zerda is suddenly making that whole cycling thing with like Glintorn Buccaneer potentially even when you're discarding cards is just a crazy, entirely crazy combination and one where if you're playing a cycling deck, certainly in Boros, which you probably are, Zerda would be one I'd definitely be looking at. I'm going to immediately say, after researching, after finding this combo myself, I researched and found that this is a combo that has been found by people before and I will link to where um, I found the resource that said, yes, it is a combo. Um, it was found on like the 15th of April, I think it was, by somebody who was like, is this, a, is this an infinite combo? Um, but I would say I independently found it, clearly just too late. Um, but Gigantha the Wellspring, who, who we already know, taps for five mana, but they can, all five colours um, for Wooburg. This mana can't be spent to pay generic mana costs, so you can only use it to pay coloured costs. Um, you couple that with High Alert, which I think is a, a, a fun deck to look at anyway, um, which the only line we care about is for two white-blue untapped target creature. Obviously, white and blue can be paid for by Gigantha. So you tap Gigantha for the five colours. You pay white and blue um, from Gigantha. Zerda takes the other two off. So you'd start off, Zerda would say, it just costs you white, blue. Gigantha would say, I'll take that white and blue. And then you can untap um, Gigantha again, in theory having black, green, and red mana left, um, which you would have infinite black, green, and red mana. So some of the powerful cards, this is quite a long list, so I'm gonna go through them really, really quickly. The powerful cards that I think could benefit from Zerda, um, and this is pretty much the list of cards. There aren't many others that would really benefit. There are some that are only one mana um, anyway, which Zerda doesn't benefit, make you benefit from. Um, but you've got cards alike. Here we go. Buckle in. The Circle of Loyalty, which allows you to create knights. Merchant of the Veil, which allows you to discard and draw for only one. Improbable Alliance which would allow you to draw and discard for four, which is still quite expensive, but every time you do, you create a fairy token, so double whammy. Fairy formation, which for two mana, you create a fairy token and draw a card, quite quite significant. Um, Dawn of Hope, which for two mana, creates you a 1-1 one, one soldier creature token um, with lifelink. Omnispell Adept, which is obviously a one use because you tap it, but you may cast an instant or sorcery from your hand without paying its mana cost. So for one blue, you could pay, you could cast an instant or sorcery for just one blue. Conclave Guild Mage, which enables you to create a 2-2 two, two green white elf knight creature token. Um, League Guild Mage, which will allow you to draw a card for two. Ledev Champion, which for three mana creates a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. Legion Guild Mage, which for, for four mana would deal three damage to each opponent. And for one mana, one white mana would tap a target creature. Shark Typhoon, <laughs> which is just a crazy card, um, which in, in theory is cycling. You would be able to cycle for one blue and create a 1-1 one, one blue shark creature token, which is silly. Having a bunch of these, just creating tokens and cycling, gaining on cycling benefits. It's still a broken card. The Almighty Brush Wag, which for two mana gets you a plus three, plus three on top, which I think play turn one. Um, and then obviously once Zerd is out uh, on turn three or four, you're gaining it for two mana, which is just silly. Hornbash Mentor, which for one green and tapping it puts a one, one counter on each creature you control with Trample. And bearing in mind some of the adept um, cards we were looking at, when it has a plus one counter on it, it gets Trample. So if they've already got plus one counters on, they all get trampled and they all get more plus one counters. Um, great combo. 
Uh, Keenan, the Bonder Prodigy, which for three and Simic, look at the top five cards of your library, put a non-human creature card from among them on the battlefield and the rest at the bottom of your library. So that could be a really powerful one for only five mana. Skycat Sovereign, which I think is a really fun combo. It's already a potentially very powerful card. If you're playing Azorius um, Flyers or even Azorius Control, and then Skycat for only white blue would create a 1 1 white cat bird token, um, which would then grow Skycat Sovereign by 1 1. So it's a double whammy for just two. Fiend Artisan benefits. Again, Fiend Artisan, what are you doing? Um, immediately you're getting plus two onto the um, cost of the creature you can find from the library. So you are tutoring a creature out of your library for two less mana. Moorland Inquisitor for one white gets first strike into the end of turn. Um, Atomus or Am Atems Atemsis, I want to call it Artemis for some reason. Atemsis all seeing um, for one blue and tapping draws two cards and then discards a card. Which I think is pretty pretty good. Spectral Sailor for just two blue draws a card, makes Spectral Sailor even better. Knight of the Ebon Legion, which would for only one black, gets plus three plus three and death touch. Um which already for three black, three mana is a good ability. To get it for only one black is very strong. Potentially somewhere that you could then put Giganthus mana as well. Um Yarox Fenlurker. For only one black would get a plus one plus one to the end of turn. Another one that could grow infinitely with Gigantha. Elvish Reclaimer um, for two and a tap, which would only be one and a tap sacrifice land. Um, you can put a land back on the battlefield. It's okay. Iron Root Warlord creates a white soldier token for three. Boros Challenger create uh, gets plus one plus one to the end of turn for just Boros colors, which already is within Zerda's Boros colors. And obviously grows with the mentor. Thirsting Shade for just one black gets plus one plus one until the end of turn and has lifelink. So all these little, yeah, you, know, you get a bunch of these small black creatures out with um, an early game, and then with the infinite combo out, they're all growing infinitely. Cult Guild Mage, which would be able to um, target player discarding a card um, for only two. Ethereal Absolution, which we know is powerful for um gets creatures are your creatures are stronger their creatures are weaker and for only white black exile target card from opponent's graveyard if it was a creature then you get a spirit token with flying and then all the omens omen of the sun omen of the sea uh, omen of the dead omen of the forge and omen of the hunt are all gaining for the fact that they can be sacrificed to scry to um, for only one mana. Thassa Deep Dwelling benefits, only two mana to tap another target creature. Perforos, this is an interesting card. Previously was thought, thought about being a really strong card, um, but if, for only one red, you may put a creature card, red creature card, or an artifact creature card from your hand onto the battlefield, sacrifice it at the beginning of your end step. It's in Zerda's colors. So for one red, now you could load your hand up with really big stuff and smash out some absolutely huge things for a couple of red mana. I think it's potential worth looking at. Definitely think it's worth looking at. Destiny Spinner, which I know is getting a lot of talk at the moment. Creature enchantments that you control can't be counted, which is definitely a benefit. I'll talk about that more in the next video. Um, three and a green, which would only be two. So one and a green, a land target land becomes XX elemental, where X is the number of enchantments you control. Scholar Grove Dancer for one green, put the top card of your library into your graveyard. Khan's Bastion um, would only be for two and tap, you proliferate, which is interesting for some of these counters we're talking about, the counter decks. Mobilize District, which again is another interesting card for two. You only, only cost you two. It becomes a 3-3 three, three citizen creature with Vigilance. Um, Zerda would make that only cost one, I believe. Gideon's Company. Whenever you gain life, you put counters on it. And for one and a white, put a loyalty counter on a Gideon Planeswalker, if you're playing a Gideon deck. 
Whew. So that was a long list of cars that I think benefits, and I know I've just rambled off a load. You're probably thinking that there are a couple of others that are really powerful that I haven't mentioned. Well, I've got a last one, last little list, and I know you're probably thinking you've got, I've gone on long enough, but genuinely think this card has been massively overlooked. Zerda as a as a companion, I think, is a really powerful option. Um, the last couple of cards. The big one that I think absolutely needs to be talked about is Kenrith, the Returned King. Kenrith is already a powerful card. Kenrith is used in a bunch of decks. It's a 5-5 five, five for 5 straight away. It's in Zerda's colours. You can make, for Boros colours, um, already for one red, all creatures have Trample and Haste until the end of turn. But for one white, if Zerda's on the battlefield, target player gains 5 life. So if you've got a bunch of white mana out, let's say you've got 5 white mana, because you're playing a mono white, you're gaining 25 life in a turn. That is so significant for some cards that require life gain, for some cards that just require you to have a high life total, potentially even for just controlling and staying alive. Um, for two mana, one of which is blue, you're drawing a card. For just one green, you're putting a plus one, plus one counter on a target creature. And then for three, one of which is black, you're putting a creature from the graveyard into the battlefield. So if you're playing multicolor with Kenrith and Zerda, I think this is a huge combo. Um, another one to think about in combination potentially with Gigantha, what we've talked about is Golos, who from a um, two and Wooburg, which Zerda would take the two away and Gigantha would pay for the Wooburg, exile the top three cards of your library, you may play them this turn without paying the mana costs. If your library is cleverly played, again, Golos could be a win condition as of itself. Phoenix of Ash, I've talked about. Zerda makes the Phoenix of Ash's plus two into the end of turn ability uh, just one mana, one red, which Gigantha could make for free. So you could have an infinitely large power Phoenix if the opponent doesn't have anything with flying or reach. Um, which so there you go. It's just just a couple of cards I think are really powerful, but ones I think could really fly off of some of the other cards I've talked about. So there's a bit of deck structuring required to make that really work, but definitely some options in there. So Zerda as a whole, as a companion, do I feel like their restrictions are specific enough to make it difficult? Um, definitely makes it tricky, but I don't think it makes it impossible to build a Zerda deck. The combos I've talked about are quite specific. Are they likely to happen in a game? Not enough, not likely enough to make them playable at a top level. Do I think it's worth trying? Yeah, for sure, absolutely. If you've got those cards, why not? Um, they're a load of fun and potentially are going to make a big, big impact in some lower level games. Do I think that Zerda's ability is worth playing? You know, absolutely. If you've got a couple of these cards, even one or two of the cards that I've mentioned, whether that's through sacrificing, through a potential Boros, cycling I think is huge for her, um, then yeah, I think Zerda could be a great card to play. Not necessarily going to feature as your companion if you need some cards that don't have activated abilities. And even as a core card, running three, two through four of these in a deck you absolutely would feel the benefit almost immediately. Her as a card on her own, without that, a 3-3 three, three for 3 that for one can mean a creature can't block, again, could potentially win games as an of herself. Could she go out there and run in a mono red deck? Probably not, but in an elemental deck, yeah, quite probably. Um, I think you're looking at a card that needs more time to process and that's probably the thing that i've i've spent the most time looking at is the possibilities seem much much larger with a zerda um build than a load of the others that i've seen which seem fairly straightforward the issue zerda is going to have in terms of some of those rakdos builds and the sacrifice decks is that there are other options out there already that are easier to build and potentially um offer more quickly without the same level of thought um like Lurus, for instance however i think zerda potentially in the longer term once people have found the combos that work 
could be a real top contender. So I would say right now Zerda's not featuring as much, but a few people ca catch on, get the combos working, get the percentages right and the card numbers right, and I think we could see Zerda in the top tier for sure. I'm not going to say where I think she ranks amongst companions because you're going to have to wait for the next video for that. Coming up this over the next week or so, you should find a full companion review and summary where I'm going to go through each companion very briefly. I'm going to rank them all and I'm going to talk about the companion mechanic in a bit more detail around where I think it could really be beneficial and where I think it has massive downsides. Um, what is the cost of running companion versus not? And are we going to see it for much longer than just this honeymoon period whilst people are having a bit of fun with it? Hopefully that won't be a particularly long video, but I am going to do as much as I can to make it a great video. So if you're excited to see that, let me know. Either way, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Watch one of the great videos that I'm hopefully surrounding me right now. And I'll see you guys for the next one. Thank you.